We haven't, though, yet spoken to somebody who was a Tory MP who joined Labour. We're delighted to be joined by former Labour Northern Ireland Secretary Sean Woodward, who's going to have a smile the size of whatever on his chop. Sean, good afternoon. Welcome to Talk Drive. Good afternoon. How are you? I'm all right, my friend. Uh, an interesting six weeks of trying to broadcast in a straight line whilst yeah. everybody's doing whatever. But now we have it. Um, what's your just initial response to last Thursday? I think, like, like a lot of people, are, I'm not surprised how people voted to get rid of the current government. Uh, I think what happened last Thursday, um, I, I think there was no guarantee that we would have that outcome. I think on all fronts there are things for everyone to consider. And I think the analysis that says, you know, Labour has done extremely well to get a very substantial majority, but unless Keir Starmer proves in the course of the next few years uh, that there really is change and change delivers for people, um, then indeed it's a shallow uh, majority that he's got. And it's not one which is necessarily guaranteed for a second election. So there's... I mean, There's I think that's. Uh, I think I think it's really interesting, Sean, because you would look at that, and this is me being completely down the centre here. You would look at that yeah. and go, "Geez, that's the biggest majority, more than Thatcher, just shy of the 1997 one." And yet, you have to remind yourselves that only 36 percent of the UK public it was a massively low turnout, but only 36 percent of the people who voted voted for a party less than Corbyn got, for God's sake, in 2019, yeah. and they've got this huge majority. I think the Liberal Democrats getting 72 seats when I know nothing about them apart from the fact that Sir Ed Davey seemed to, 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 to partake in a series of bizarre PR opportunities. They got 72 seats. I think the election, as you quite rightly nailed, in my opinion, was let's just get rid of the Tories at any cost. And and I think, I, I think you're right. It, I mean, Boris Johnson's 80-seat majority was sandpaper, wasn't it? Sandcastleist, could we? And I think, I think they have to do it. What do you make, before we talk about today, what do you make of the initial let's release 40,000 prisoners and give an amnesty to 100,000 migrants? That hasn't gone down brilliantly with people, to be fair. Look, I'm very interested by the appointment of James Timpson. Um, James comes from a very interesting family. You may remember that when Gordon Brown was Prime Minister, there was the most awful by-election in Crewe and Nantwich when Gwyneth Dunwoody died. And it was James's brother, Edward, who was uh, standing for the Conservative Party and my party, by then the Labour Party, uh, attacked him in that by-election as being a toff and having had a privileged background. Everybody then discovered, of course, that he came from Timpson's and the work that John Timpson, their father, did was extraordinary was. for prisoners. Mm -hmm. So. The, the reason I, I labour that, Jeremy, is because I think that people want change to happen. I think they want this to work. And if James, along with the Home Secretary, is reaching views on the prison population, we can all go for slogans. But, you know, Boris Johnson specialised in slogans mm -hmm. and it was a disaster for the country. So I'm inclined to feel that a very sane appointment like James Timpson to this job we need to give him the benefit of the doubt. If it turns out he's right, it'll be very good. If it turns out he's wrong, then all those who wish this government not to succeed, I'm sure will be very happy. Very interesting. But I think the time has come. Let's give them the benefit of the doubt. Also, uh, Sir Patrick Vallance, Science uh, Minister, uh, Jackie, uh, Jackie Smith, the ex-Home Secretary. Um, there's been a lot from Labour over the years, and this isn't me sticking up for the Tories, they were a shambles at the end. Um, about, you know, the system and giving jobs to your mates. He's already created three peerages to put people into government. What does that say to all the people who are Labour MPs? But what does it also say about a system that in the past he's criticised massively, Sean? I think what it says is that many people may have underestimated Keir Starmer's determination to get things moving as quickly as possible. Bringing in, as I say, for example, James Timpson is proof that you want to bring in somebody who understands what you might need to do in prisons rather than throw slogans around. Bringing in Patrick Valance is to actually bring in somebody who actually might understand science. Um, the decision by Wes Streeting today to bring Aradazi, who's one of the most formidable surgeons in the country with enormous respect across the medical profession, to undertake the review of the NHS 
seems to me to be entirely sensible. And when you know, for example, that the mess the Tories left behind actually means that the number of people waiting for hip replacements is 50% larger than it was before COVID, then actually maybe it's a good idea to get some people who I th- are I th- I think practiced what's the- in the field and use the House of Lords, not, I'm afraid, just to cram it with cronies and party donors in the way that Cameron and others have done, uh, but actually to use the House of Lords as a way of getting people into the system and really quickly. What if do you make very briefly... To the... I know you on, defected sorry. from them. What do you make very briefly for the future of the Tory party? Many people massively angry with Sunak. I mean, your, 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 your view, if you're a leader of a party, you're the Prime Minister, you can call an election. They seem to get it wrong. They didn't apparently have any... Uh, apparently they had no bo- they hadn't booked any advertising space they didn't have leaflets they didn't have candidates his cabinet didn't know labor apparently were ahead of the the the, the game um it was a, a shambles of a campaign i've come to the assumption which you'll probably disagree with because i'm not sure we've ever agreed but you might agree with me i think he was a very good chance i think anybody would be popular if they were giving away 400 billion quid i think he was found out with the top job i think he was too technical i don't think he was a conviction politician i don't know what he stood for and i think he did whatever it good took to get the job including you know creating that alliance with suella bravman that blew up in his face and i think he was found out sean don't you yeah i mean there is something that somebody once observed about politicians whatever party they're in you only really know whether they're up to the job when they're in it Mm. and and i think that we were all surprised by how rishi sunak in the end i think he's a nice guy I, i just probably just didn't have it i think what's surprising for a lot of people about keir starmer uh, is that having thought that he might be a bit of a quiet man and a bit of an average guy is already turning out to be pretty ruthless in the way that he's conducting business. He's really getting on with it and he's wasting no time. And the one thing that's been interesting listening to the conversations you were just having about the Tory leadership and remembering I was elected in 1997 when John Major was leader, that uh, obviously changed within a few weeks because the Tories had lost the election. I found myself in a parliament where we were down to about 166 MPs, slightly more than now in the Tory party. Um, And what was interesting to me, Jeremy, was how unlike perhaps some of those who may want the leadership in the Tory party, how hard William Hague was working from the very second the Tories were defeated. And, uh, you know, Ken Clark, who was a man I liked enormously, was, I think, with hindsight and looking back, a little too laid back in thinking I need to let time pass a bit before I really get my campaign going. And by the time we got that campaign going with Ken Clark, William Hague had secured it. Very quickly, two, so, three, two very quick questions for you, Sean. I could talk to you all day, you yeah. know that. It's just time. Who do you believe the next leader will be of the Tory party? Really hard at this stage to say. OK. I, I, I think until we actually know whether it's going to be decided by the members of parliament or by the uh, members of the party, uh, that's a different outcome. And a a very important observation I would make, Jeremy, about this. Um, You've got, as leader of the party, to be able to lead the members in the House of Commons. Yeah. So if you have a leader who doesn't command the support of those members of parliament behind him or her... You can't do the job. And that's partly why the Tories got themselves into such a mess over the last several years. And they've got to align that. And therefore, you know, if we learn something from the Labour Party in 2015, when they lost the election again, Ed Miliband stood down so quickly and Jeremy Corbyn stepped in. I think perhaps the one thing Rishi Sunak might be getting right, despite the pressure, is not leaving right now i have to cut because you there i have to cut you there not because i want to sean it's always a pleasure i completely it's a really really interesting angle to take